Lander. And our speaker is telling us today about cold atoms and metrology. Panie Krzysztofie, now the floor or podłoga jest pana. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I decided to speak about topic in which I, I don't feel an expert. It's likely that there will be real experts in the audience. Uh, but I decided to speak about it because I'm entering this field. I wanted to understand a few things also. And uh, that's why I will speak, uh, I hope, on a very basic level. So about this quantum metrology, I will speak using an example, concrete example of atomic clock. And on this example, I will try to introduce uh, what are useful correlations which can be used in uh, precise measurements and I will introduce quantities as Fisher information and the Wigner function. And only then I will jump to my main topic which is Bose-Einstein condensate and uh, I will try to convince you that this BEC, Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, can be useful in the interferometry. Uh, this work is in progress actually so we, I will end up not only with conclusions, but there will be many questions. So what you see here is the level structure of electronic ground state of cesium. So this ground electronic ground state is splitted um, because of coupling between uh, nuclear angular momentum and uh, total angular momentum. This is splitted into two lines denoted with f equal 3 and f equal 4, there's some long number in the gigahertz which is telling you what is the frequency of photon which could excite the atom from f equal 3 to f equal 4. By the way, I would say that the magnetic moments are coupled, not angular momenta, because there is no interaction between angular momenta as such. Okay, yes. Magnetic moments. Magnetic moments. Yes. Okay, but I, I have shown it uh, because there is some peculiar thing. Next to this number, it's written exact. And among all possible uh, transitions in all possible atoms, this is the only transition which is exact. No other transition is exact, of course. Exactly, and this is temporarily exact because this number comes from the definition and if the definition of second will be changed, then it will be no longer exact. This is just the, our unit of, of frequency which, is, which serves as a unit of energy in a, for these transitions. What is this definition of second? Uh, the second is the duration of, this is a long number, periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels, this F equal 3 and F equal 4, of the ground state of cesium 133 atom. This is the definition. And then there is the question how to use this definition. So typical scenario starts with N atoms, which all of them are prepared in the same internal state. With cat 0, I denote F equal 3, the lower from these two hyperfine levels. So this is our assumption that uh, the state has this structure. We'll try to restrict ourselves to the subspace of only two levels, 0 and 1. Then uh, we can think about the atom as a qubit, and any state of qubit can be expressed in this general form with two angles parameterizing coefficients, theta and phi. And then uh, often such a state is expressed on the Bloch sphere. So for instance, if atom is in zero, to this corresponds an arrow which is pointing to the south pole. What is usually measured is just the difference between number of atoms in one and numbers of atoms in, in zero, by conventions divided by two. And uh, what is uh, accessible in experiment are uh, rotation on, on, of state on the block sphere, but only collective ones. So the typical uh, transformations used in such experiments I we're talking about are collective unitary operations. Collective in the sense that each atom is, for instance, rotated in the same way. These are ingredients. 
what is protocol. So we started, as I said already, with all atoms in state zero, and then by this unitary transformation, the, each atom is in zero is transformed to superposition zero plus one over square root of two. Uh, it's assumed that, well, usually yeah, these atoms are uh, in some very dilute cloud, that's why they are not interacting, and uh, they are kept in a meteorological environment. So we wanted to somehow decouple these atoms from all possible fields as much as is possible. And because of that, the spatial degrees of freedom will not will not enter the discussion. People focus only on this internal degrees of freedom. Well, of course, this is simplification, but uh, at least to understand how this clock is working, it's enough to think about internal degrees of freedom. Once we prepare each atom in this superposition, 0 plus 1 over square root of 2, then there's just waiting time. This is called interrogation time. And during this time, the system is evolving due to this simple Hamiltonian. Uh, Hamiltonian is just the well, number of atoms in state zero times energy of the zero level plus number of atoms in one times energy of the level one. It can be written in more, more convenient form as this h bar omega clock is just the difference between E1 and E0, this difference of the energies. And here is this uh, SZ operator, uh, which one can measure, is the imbalance between one and zero. And it should be one minus and zero. So it doesn't matter so much here. And uh, this state zero is eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, also state one is eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. So if we have atom in the superposition zero plus one over square root of two, then, during this waiting time, this interrogation time, due to this Hamiltonian, what is imprinted is the relative phase between 1 and 0. And as the uh, qubit is expressed on the block sphere of this formula, this relative angle phi is an azimuthal angle, so it's like uh, by this first operation we are taking the, the state from south pole to the equator, and during this dynamic it's just rotating. Okay, and what is then measured? After the interrogation time t, there is sudden rotation around y-axis, and the measurement is the only thing which is usually measured is SZ, is the imbalance between number of atoms in zero and one. So, uh, for instance, if for interrogation time zero, mm -hmm. t equals zero, so we started with the south pole, then there was this rotation, then immediate next rotation around y, we end up with all atoms in state one, so this average as z is n over two, without any discrepancy actually. For some finite interrogation time, we are doing such an operation that we are taking our atoms from a south pole to the equator, there is some evolution, and then there is next rotation, and the projection on z axis is, is, this, is this value is here. So because of this uh, rotation of the state on the equator, we have then oscillation of average SZ. This is of the heart of of, of a atomic clock. How, how to use this uh, in atomic clock? Well, atomic clock should consist of, uh, well, roughly speaking, two parts. One is, uh, let's say, pendulum, some local oscillator, some device which is producing uh, regular beats. And then the signal from this device is transmitted to satellites and uh, measurements from different satellites are compared and then we have this global time. But to call it atomic clock, this device should be regularly calibrated with, with a frequency standard with the clock. So typical protocol starts uh, such that we uh, we do what I what I said before. So we are preparing the initial state for atoms, and we count the time using our uh, local oscillator. I should say maybe not time, but uh, we we'll, uh, we'll count number of beats uh, produced by local oscillator, and then 
let's say at this time at which expect that this average Z would be equal to zero, at this time we do measurements of atoms and compare if this was indeed uh, zero or not. If uh, if this was zero as the time at which we at the time at which we expected zero, it was zero measured, then we would say that this local oscillator is synchronized with, with atomic frequency standard and everything is fine. But of course, usually it's not so. Usually this average Z is just a, a bit above or a bit uh, below zero, and then it means that there is some mismatch between local oscillator and frequency standard, and we have to tune frequency of the local oscillator such that it will match uh, frequency standard in the next measurements. Uh, and there is uh, some practical issue, at least in this um, laboratory with, um, with which I was uh, collaborating. They were doing two measurements. They were doing me one measurement at the time T0 minus some delta. The result of this measurement is Z minus one, uh, Z minus. And the next measurement at the, a bit later, at the time T0 plus delta. And the result of measurement is S at plus. And from these two measurements, uh, they were trying to uh, estimate this mismatch between this and this. But only two measurements were taken. Uh, you have stable device here. Then, uh, instead of looking at first period, you, you can start to look at this average SZ at later times for, for the next fringes of oscillations, and in this way you can, uh, you can make the interrogation time longer and longer, and with this you are gaining the precision. So this is the adaptive procedure in which you would like to have this interrogation time T as long as possible, and continuously you, you should compare the results of uh, measurements on atom with uh, with local oscillator. Can I ask what, what physically this local oscillator is? Is it some kind of... Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> is this some kind of uh, LC circuit or, or, yes, or yes, this is a, a cavity with microwaves? Usually, well, there are different local oscillators. The best one now, these are optical comps, but still in use are uh, electric piezo, uh, piezoelectric crystals. They are nice because they have uh, oscillations which are immediately transferred into electric signal. And as there are piezoelectric signal, one can, uh, using external uh, fields, change, tune this frequency. So what are ingredients in this interferometry? We have to prepare the state. Then uh, we have to do interferometer. I put here quotation because as interferometer in quantum metrology, people understand all these uh, unitary operations plus interrogation time. So as interferometer, they mean a procedure in, uh, for instance, in our case, you are doing two rotations and there is this free evolution. Then one has to perform measurement and build an estimator. So in this case, the estimator was actually this Z plus plus Z minus inverse to, to translate, transform it to the uh, frequency mismatch. One has to be the estimator based on measurements, of course. These are the ingredients. Coming back to, to clock, of course there are some uh, noises. If you measure this as Z, you have discrepancy, there is many noises. Among them, there is something which is called projection noise. Because our state for n atoms is, was this one. Each atom in the superposition 0 plus 1 over square root of 2. If you will measure average as z, so number of atoms in 0 minus number of atoms in 1 in this state, uh, this is 0 in average, but the result, probability of possible measurements as z, is given by this binomial distribution. So it has some width, dispersion square root of n, and this width will, well, will enter your estimation. It will influence your measurement. Uh, actually, what is important is the uh, fluctuations compared to signal. So 
effect of this noise can be very small. Actually, it was uh, for the first time, I think, in 1999, when this projection noise, called quantum noise, entered budget of different noises. So before it was even not uh, visible, it was covered by other things. In 1991, these people, uh, there was a group from uh, Paris, um, Ecole Christophe Salomon from Ecole Normale Supérieure, in collaboration with uh, Observatoire uh, de Paris, they, uh, they changed the local oscillator. Say, so they changed this device to something more stable, more accurate, and only then they have seen some traces of this quantum noise. Usually it's not very important, was not very important, but now there are such devices, such uh, interferometers, which are very precise and in which this noise starts to be of some importance. For instance, uh, there is this uh, gravitational field detector, the gravitational wave detector, uh, in which they will introduce some squeeze states to uh, decrease the effect of, of uh, quantum noise. So it's getting practical issue. So as I said, the discrepancy of measurement of SZ will introduce some uncertainty of, uh, of this omega time t measurement. The very simple rough estimation of uh, how the noise in SZ is transferred into noise in omega is, is just from a simple geometry. It's the derivation you can find at the first year or at the university. Uh, and the estimation will give you that the uh, fluctuation of, of the thing you are trying to estimate, this omega t, is given by this fluctuation of SZ divided by the uh, deriva time derivative of, of average SZ. This formula is telling you that the smaller the fluctuation, the better will be the measurement, but also the larger this derivative, also the measurement will be better. That's why actually the measurement is always done when this average SZ is equal to zero, because here this derivative is the highest one. This is the point in which you, you gain the sensitivity. But this is a very rough estimation, and people devised other quantities, and this is the place where this Fisher information appears, uh, because it was derived that the uh, uncertainty of omega t measurement has to be larger equal than 1 over square root of some number. This number is a function of state. It's like optimized over all possible interferometric schemes and all possible measurements. There is such quantity, you can compute it on the state, and it will give you some bound on the possible uh, uncertainty. But before I will uh, um, tell you how I understand this feature, I wanted to say a few words about Wigner function, uh, which is uh, actually a very useful tool here. So Wigner function is also a function of uh, which you compute for state, and this function of uh, theta and phi. I'm speaking specifically about uh, n qubits. It's one-to-one -one correspondence to uh, to state. So if you have Wigner function, you can reconstruct state. If you have state, you can compute the Wigner function. This Wigner function for n qubits was introduced in, a, in the 90s by uh, Agarwal, and then he had a paper with Dowling and Schleich. Uh, but I have not given you formula because the formula is just very long. It's like a few lines of equations to define this Wigner function. Uh, I'm saying about the Wigner function because it's a very nice visualization of the state. state. Instead of a formula for state, we have a picture of state. Uh, n qubits are visualized on a sphere with the radius n over 2. And here is the Wigner function of our initial state of 0 plus 1 over square root of 2. So it's on the sphere and it's some um, so-called Gaussian state. So it's just one, one peak. Can that be Gaussian for the qubit? Gaussian Why? for the continuous variable. 
Yes, well, it's close to Gaussian. It's, it has binomial distribution, but usually people refer to this kind of states as a Gaussian state, indeed. But it's, uh, well, strictly speaking, maybe it's uh, some simplification, but... Yes, yes, for small n, indeed, this would be not wide definitely, for large n. And the, the, the central limit theorem says that yes. this is essentially in, the Gaussian. In, in the yeah, and they are talking about the large n. Uh, okay, this state which is evolving, uh, it's will nicely express using this Wiener function, this uh, initial initial blob is just rotating around Z. And the whole idea of atomic clock is to synchronize the period of this oscillation with some local oscillator. how it's connected to Fisher information. Uh, well, here I plotted the Wigner function. I'm sorry, but it was better to plot the Wigner function of a coherent state. So here's the continuous variable. And the Fisher information is such a quantity which is telling you how fast the state would change under some translation here. So here is the cut. The Wigner, Wigner function of a cut state, it has these fringes, and if you shift the state along this arrow, it will change rapidly because these uh, positive fringes will start to overlap with negative fringes. So the changes of the state are the fastest if you, translate, if you transform, shift the state along this line. And they are fast because of these of this, uh, narrow structures in the Wigner function. So this is, um, maybe I should write it on the table. <coughs> so the state is cut state. Yes. And on the axis, there is real part of alpha and imaginary part of alpha. Yes. Well, the message uh, is that if you have some narrow structures in the Wigner function, it offers you high Fisher information. The idea is that if you put this state to interferometer, this interferometer is producing some, uh, well, at least for a short time, it's like uh, some, sh some small shifts. So interferometer will shift the state a little bit, and maybe you will be able to distinguish the state before shift and after shift. I don't know how clear it was. No, it was not clear at all, because what is the relation of this cat state to the cubic states that you showed on the previous Yeah, so, uh, to be a moment. So maybe I should show. This is the Wigner function of the, of the cat state for qubits, exactly for this state. Yes, this is the cut state in which n atoms are in superposition 0 plus 1 over square root of 2, or over 2, because there is 1 over square root in front of, and uh, at the same time, they are in the super, uh, well, this is superposition of all atoms in 0 plus 1 and all atoms in 0 minus 1. This state is orthogonal to this state, this is macroscopic, and uh, this is the Wigner function of this state. It has a bit similar structure to this uh, continuous version. There are these two ma local maxima, and there are these fringes. Uh, our what, is the, what is the analogy of this alpha? There's no analogy of uh, it. Well. well, maybe this n somehow plays the role of alpha, or at least modulus of alpha. Mm. So, yeah, uh, this is parameterized by two angles. The definition of Wigner function for this qubit state is ambiguous. Kioski has been working on that for years, and uh, there is no unique way of defining the Wigner function. Well, okay, but I can imagine that this is a function that is a function. something, okay. I, there is a very long definition of it, okay. but what is the, what is the 
the analog of alpha by ever since. But I see some kind of phase of alpha because there is real part plus high times. So in continuous, uh, let's say, uh, thinking about this cat, in a continuous version, this is for example of a cat state. In the, uh, for qubits, the Wiener function is a function of two angles, theta and phi. So the question is about the relation between alpha and theta and phi. So uh, this theta, If you take modulus alpha, then it's cosine theta over 2, at least for this definition of the Wiener function, which is uh, generally used for, for qubits. No. And phi. In the usual case, it's not restricted to values less than 1. Um, Cosine can be slightly larger. Yes, 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 you are right. It should be alpha is n cosine. Okay. Sorry. It's, uh, and the uh, argument of alpha is this phi. This is the, if you would like to translate one Wiener function to another, to have some rough, at least, idea how they are connected, this would be the prescription. But there are two different situations. Yes, this is a continuous variable, then there is discrete, so there's, well, this is some analogy, but it's, uh, it can fail in, in certain situations. Okay. But I understand that this particular choice of Wigner function for qubits is not important. What matters is that we can draw some pictures. Yes. Yes. And I no, guess that... Uh, great physical significance for this particular choice. For picture. Picture. Except that something is moving. Mm. Well. Well, if you have this Wigner function, as in the continuous case, you can uh, relatively easily compute, for instance, averages. So uh, uh, you can use this uh, to get uh, to compute something physical. But somehow, irrespectively of what kind of a Wigner function you use, some results will turn out to be the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is some kind of a cage. Yeah. Well, and uh, I said that these fringes, mm. they make this state useful in the interferometry. Because if you put this state to interferometer, as I have shown you, this interferometer is just a rotation, a rotation of the state. Interfer <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. I, I will try again. Uh, if you have these fringes and you will try to use the state in atomic clock. In atomic clock, the state is just rotating. If it rotate around this axis, let's call it X axis, then after small rotation, the overlap between this state and the state which is rotated would be small. Because these negative fringes will start to overlap with positive and the fidelity between these two, the overlap would be small. What is telling you that the state is very sensitive to small rotation. And this is what we need in this interferometer. I was giving you the formula that the uncertainty is connected to the speed of changes, actually. So this would be my <laughs> explanation. To this or no? Yeah, yeah, sure. The, 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 okay, oh, this is so, so clear. You said that in atomic clock, it's this superposition zero plus one is used as a state. But now you are saying that there's this cat state is better, right? Yeah, I, I jumped this slide to uh, to show you this Wigner function of the cat instead of a continuous version in the discrete version. But now I will. Uh, I would like to translate, why, uh, say why I'm telling you about this cat. Because the, this procedure in atomic clocks, when we use this state 0 plus 1 over square root of 2, if you compute this Fisher information, we'll find this uncertainty has to be larger than 1 over square root of n. But if you change the scheme, for instance, if you will choose another state as the initial state, maybe you can measure this quantity more precise. 
So the obvious choice would be to would actually use would be to use uh, some squeeze state. And here is the uh, the squeeze state, which is put this interferometer. And then you will find that this uh, shaded area indicating the, the uh, uncertainty t is getting much smaller than before. So the message is that if you will change the procedure in atomic clock and use instead of the state uh, which is now used, 0 plus 1 over square root of 2, some another state, then maybe you can measure something uh, with smaller uncertainty. This is the idea. Uh, and to find what state is the best, you should maximize this Fisher information. Because the uncertainty is limited by the 1 over square root of the Fisher information. The larger the Fisher information, the smaller the possible uncertainty. OK. Now I will tell you about Bose-Einstein condensate and how we we'll use this uh, BEC in, in interferometry, in what sense it can be used. So, short reminder, Bose-Einstein condensate is such many body state that uh, the sway function to a good approximation is a product of the same orbital which is occupied by all, this all, all atoms. It stems from the fact that if you lower temperature, for instance, then uh, all bosons try to gather in the same, in the same state. But this orbital, it, uh, one can prove that it should be computed using gross pitayevsky equation, which is given here. There is something wrong with this formula, because on the left-hand side you have just a simple function. On the right-hand side you it's have cat. a vector. Yes, should be, uh, it should be a state. It should be state. shouldn't be this. So this is missing. This is, yes. Just a product Yes. Same problem here. Yes, it will propagate, I'm unfortunately. Okay. Here you cannot just this. Yes, I will. <laughs> here is needed, in fact. Because uh, we'd like to use the same procedure as it was for clock for Bose Einstein condensate. So we'd like to have Bose Einstein condensate for atoms in some internal level denoted with zero, and then by this pulse transfer the zero to say proposition, zero plus one over square root of two. So we'd like to have this initial state. So what is on the left hand side? Also the state. So the state, well, this is the state, but with uh, internal degrees of freedom. It's, it's, it could be so written as a spinor. Also have some indices corresponding Should have. Well, the free evolution in the previous example of atoms which are not interacting, the free evolution was very simple, then uh, the, the state was just rotating around Z. Here the situation will be m more complicated, because if we, for instance, for instance, asked about this uh, orbital which is occupied, this orbital was computed with the help of the gross pitayevsky equation, but the gross pitayevsky equation is nonlinear. So if we change the number of atoms in a zero state, for instance, we put to zero state half of the atoms and half of the atoms to the another state, then the solution of gross pitayevsky equation will be different. It means that doing this path, zero, transferring zero to zero plus one, plus one of a square root of two, we start with some excited states. There will be some non-trivial spatial dynamics. But uh, people would like to work in a, for dilute gases, in which these orbitals, although different, they are at least close to each other. But even then, the Hamiltonian for internal degrees of freedom is not as before. Because of this interaction between atoms, we have additional terms which actually mimic uh, kernel linearities from, uh, for photons. But what will happen if you just blindly use the, uh, well, repeat the procedure from atomic clock on BC, 
then we see this kind of picture that is average as z this modulus of that is, is decreasing and the noise is getting larger and larger and dynamics in the Wigner function is very complicated it looks like chaotic well, what does this represent? is this a solution of the Grosky-Tanieski equation? so I wanted to uh, so again we started with uh, such a situation that uh, all internal, all atoms are in the same internal degrees of freedom, zero plus one over square root of two, in the same superposition, I'm sorry. And then we have this Hamiltonian. In this Hamiltonian, there is the term which was before, this omega clock, which is just the uh, connected to a difference of energy between one and zero. But there are some additional terms which come from interaction. What I'm showing in the next slide is the average as z uh, which is evolving, well, the state is evolving due to this Hamiltonian. But where is the noise in this description? Here is no noise. But you had the noise on the... Ah, so this noise is just the uh, flux uncertainty of SZ. So I can compute average SZ and plus and minus uh, dispersion of SZ. This is giving uh, the shaded, shaded area. Z is the average, this average Z is just the, the average of number of atoms in zero minus number of atoms in one. But after this acid clock, the one has to do the rotation, first uh, zero to superposition zero plus one, then there is this evolution to this Hamiltonian, and then again a rotation. And only then you are computing as Z. So it's not simply given by the Hamiltonian, but it's like before for this atomic clock, we have this part which is taking the state from a uh, south pole to, to the equator. This is written here. Then you have evolution due to this Hamiltonian. And then the measurement is uh, next pass and, uh, and measurement of SZ. On the other hand, if you look at the evolution of the Fisher information as a function of, of time, we will see that this is increasing from uh, n. So initially we have coherent state. For coherent state, this feature is n. To uh, n square, which is the best possible fishing information for, uh, for qubits, for n qubits. And in this evolution, the state which appeared for, um, for chi t called pi over 2, let me, the state. Uh, which corresponds to the maximal Fisher information is the cat state, should be a cat state. Where the, this cat is, the, as I said before, is the superposition of all atoms in zero plus one plus all atoms in zero minus one. So each qubit is at the same time, uh, all qubits are pointing in, a, in one direction of the block sphere plus all qubits are pointing in the opposite direction of the block sphere. This, this is the cat. Here in this formula. Uh, I? Yeah. Imaginary unit. Ah, this. No. No, no. This is a, the state which really appears in this evolution, but it doesn't matter here. So one points to the east, one points to the west. Here. Yes. Uh, the, Uh, in what sense and among what states does this cat state maximize the Fisher information? Among all possible states, among all BEC states? So we would like to uh, ask an inverse question. Yes, I have this n square. What are the states which would yes. give n square? I'm not sure. I okay, think this is the known. critical point which, which gives this n square, but uh, I cannot answer the inverse question. There is maybe a remix? No. Okay. <laughs> yes, but if Fisher is n square, it doesn't have to be cut state. This one expected actually. So to use the uh, Bose Einstein condensates in quantum meteorology, one should do two-step interferometry. First, one has to prepare the state 
using the dynamics I was just showing, this dynamics in which the cut state w should appear spontaneously. And on phase two, one should somehow decrease the atomic density such that the atoms will not interact with themselves and repeat the typical procedure for the atomic clock. So the gain from BC is that it will serve uh, as a producer of a good quantum state which can be used later in their interferometry. This is the idea. For the time being, in experiments, they are used only states which appear for very short evolution times. So this procedure is already accomplished, but only for states which appear at short times. These states are squeeze states, and there were uh, two experiments, one in Basel, uh, performed by Philip Troitlein, and the second one in Heidelberg, performed in Marcus Obert Haller, and they built magnetometer. They used uh, Bose-Einstein condensate to produce squeeze state, and they used this state to, uh, to find the value of the magnetic field with, indeed, uh, good precision. This was proof of principle experiment, so they cannot be the best magnetometers around the world, but they can show that this, this entangled entanglement can help. But of course, what is crucial, there are some decoherences, because if we'd like to use the states which appear later, these are uh, some very entangled states, like, for instance, cut states, but all these states usually are very sensitive to decoherence. And in both the Einstein condensate, the typical uh, decoherence source are particle losses. You cannot avoid this. And this is uh, my main subject of, of interest. I'm working with these particle losses, and I would like to find what is the usefulness of both the Einstein condensate for interferometry once we include these particle losses. What are the sources of particle losses? We have uh, one body losses, which comes from the fact that the gas is kept in, a, in some chamber in which the vacuum is not perfect. There are some atoms in the background. These atoms are colliding with atoms in BEC, and because these atoms from background are usually very fast, they are kicking out uh, condensed atoms. This is, these are one body losses. Uh, there are fundamental three body losses. Well at the temperature at which BEC is produced, there should be no gas of cesium or rubidium, but uh, there should be a piece of metal. There should be solid state. And indeed, the uh, gaseous Bose-Einstein condensate is metastable state, which is converging into a solid state via three body, what we call three body losses. It's just that uh, the atoms start to, be, to, to glue, but to uh, fulfill the momentum and the conservation momentum conservation law and energy conservation law, you, you need three atoms. We should, they should meet three atoms. And then, depending on what states are using, sometimes there are two body losses, in which during collision the state is changed, and because these uh, traps are uh, sometimes magnetic, then the, after collision, the, if the internal state is changed, uh, the, state, the atoms in this new internal state, they, they don't feel the potential. They are not kept in container, they just escape. And all these losses are, uh, are included in the evolution via the master equation. So this is the equation, the Lindblad term. The first part would be uh, just von Neumann part. But the effect of losses comes here, where appears uh, operator C with two indices, I and J. The form of C is written here. A0 is the annihilation operator for atoms in 0, A1 is annihilation operator for atoms in 1, so this operator Cij, it, it annihilates I atoms in 0 and J atoms in 1. So we have a collection of all these kinds of, of operators. Uh, this equation was uh, well derived also by me by, for one body losses. There are some sketches that are not rigorous derivation in case of uh, other kind of losses. But, uh, well, I was solving this equation uh, and com we're comparing this with experiment. It seems that it's a reasonable tool to, to study the losses. So I learned already some time ago how to efficiently 
find a state, well, how to efficiently, efficiently solve this, this kind of master equation. And now I'm using this, uh, my methods and solutions to, uh, to find this usefulness of BC in interferometry. And this is one of uh, results. So here on the x-axis, oh, sorry, there should be number of atoms in one. Here is the optimal fissure, and each point corresponds to a procedure in which we're trying to uh, to optimize over trap frequencies, the distances between these uh, two traps, keeping BECs, between the total number of atoms also. So these points comes from some extensive searching algorithm, which was trying to optimize the fissure information. Well, here I plot it as a function of the number of atoms in, a, in a one of these two modes, but we have similar pictures for fissure versus uh, different trap frequencies and so on. So there are many parameters, and uh, this is done for rubidium-87 for the situation which is uh, available now in, a, in, a, in Basel. And actually, the, among these points, these gray points, which, uh, which come from this optimization procedure, there are blue ones which correspond to, let's say, safe and reasonable parameters. So we focus on, on this, and we, do, we did the uh, analysis of particle losses, but also other decoherence sources as the fluctuation of the total number of atoms, we include some imperfection in the detectors and higher order nonlinearities to find states which will maximize the fissure information and then maybe will be used in, a, in this interferometry. So uh, shortly speaking we found cut state but uh, it turned out that instead of the symmetric cut as before it's much better to have some kitten such state where number of atoms in one mode is large and in the second is small. So it's like like hand but uh, but close to the south pole. If one project the state on a, on a plane then the cut looks like that. This is what we have found but it's not the end of the story because still there is the question how to use it in the interferometry. Optimizing this fissure information, we have found that uh, to benefit from this high fissure information, one should look at the statistics of average values of SZ. But it doesn't mean that this is SZ which you have to measure. Namely, I want to say that if you look at the evolution of average value of SZ operator, when the initial state is this cut state and, and you are performing the typical atomic clock experiment, then you will find that this average SZ uh, is constant, it's not evolving in time, and actually the error is large. Just telling you that the average SZ is not quantity which would be sensitive for this useful correlation in the cut state. Uh, the thing you should measure is the parity for it, which is just the product of sigma z matrices for, for different number of for, for different atoms. So it's like minus one to number of atoms in one. This is the uh, quantity which which is good, which is good in the sense that this average parity it has very fast oscillations. Average parity parity computed the, for evolving cut state is like cosine of n omega t. So just this this, this uh, speed of, of changes in phase is increased n times because of, uh, of the presence of the cat state. But on the other hand, this is the quantity you would not like to measure. Because even if you lose one atom, this average parity instead of oscillating function will drop to a constant equal to zero. Even if there are no losses, uh, still, to, have, to find the average parity equal to zero it means that you have to perform plenty of measurements because each measurement is giving of parity of this quantity is giving you minus one or plus one. So you need plenty of measurements to find average parity equal to zero. So it's also not practical. 
it's maybe not so uh, surprising that you need such quantity because it's enter like n body correlation function. Well, to benefit this uh, highly entangled state, you need to to measure something which uh, which is consisted from a higher order correlations, and this is such a quantity. It's not complete size fiction to measure this parity because there are some experiments in which this parity was used, but the experiments were limited to very small number of atoms, like three ions. So although we have found that, uh, well, for experiments one can find a cut state, we know that this cut state will not be useful in the interferometry because to use this state one need to measure thing which is totally not practical. So if one change the question and ask what is the best Fisher information but measuring just averages of operators, then you will find that the best things, best states are just the, the squeezed states. And on this plot of this Fisher information, the Fisher which is based on the uh, average or, um, the Fisher which is based on the on the estimators based on average as Z are limited uh, to, to very short times and uh, these are squeeze states. Then one can ask the question what would be the best state if you include losses uh, because we know that these are squeeze state then we know that uh, the best well then we have to find how is change squeezing with, uh, with, uh, with losses and then it turned out that uh, from the paper of IHS Sinatra actually that once the losses are included, there are some limits on the on the best possible squeezing. So as the result, in the limit of large number of atoms, actually it is the best to have just slightly squeezed states. So that the benefit from this quantum correlation in the limit of large number of atoms will be very, very small. And that's it. Uh, so I would devote a lot of time actually to find the, uh, that it is possible to to find Schrodinger cut state in both the Einstein condensate, but as I said, it's not practical in an interferometry. And we would like to find what the, still what is the best strategy, because maybe instead of measuring average as z, it's still enough to measure average as z square or some higher order correlation functions, but but not and body correlation function. So this is uh, in progress. Thank you for the attention. We had a lot of questions during the new procedure didn't work for really. okay. you. Okay. speak to them. Well, maybe I... I after to say okay, maybe I know the answer, but maybe you can say it yourself. Where is the difference between this coherent state of matter and single atoms, collection of independent atoms? What is the difference between? Uh, well, if, because you assume that you perform ex your experiments with both Einstein condensation. Yes. Okay, very good. So, but w can you pinpoint the place where this coherence plays a role? Ah, this, that this is both the Einstein that condensation. This is both con Einstein condensated, not individual atoms. Well, here practically it doesn't matter. Once this uh, inter interferometer, the, well, initially, it's not so actually a simple answer. Uh, there is, for instance, experiment in, uh, in the group of Jakob Reichel where they um, cooled the atoms to both the Einstein condensate simply to have access to collective operation that in uh, both the Einstein condensates but from the fundamentals uh, everything is collective all atoms are smeared everywhere and then uh, if we perform some rotation it's very easy to to do it collectively to do the rotation all atoms so indeed there was such an experiment that they they could atoms to both the Einstein condensate only to have access to to clean uh, rotations to clean local operations or local to, to clean collective operations concerning this uh, interferometry uh, well in this to use this, this state which appear here in the interferometry one has to uh, well make the traps shallower such that the density will be smaller such that this interaction will be negligible 
and then this uh, this coherence is practically doesn't matter. This co the, the spatial coherences doesn't matter. But the very cold atoms are useful because there is no Doppler effect, which would uh, yes, yes. So uh, typically, typically in a in atomic clocks, uh, they cool atoms, but just above the condensation. Because to reach condensation, they will lose a lot of atoms, actually, because of evaporative cooling. So uh, typically, there are atoms which are as cool as possible, but above the condensation. So in other words, the true ide identical wave function for each atom is really not the most important thing. No, no, no. No. So if there are no more questions, we thank the speaker.